So what are forces? Well, believe it or not, they are all around you. I want you to read along to explore forces and motion. When we're done with today's lesson, you will log on to Epic and you will read the book yourself called Forces and Motion through Infographics and then you'll take a quiz. So today what we're going to learn about this story is Forces and Motion through Infographics. You're going to be learning about heavy physics concepts that sure can weigh down your brain. You need to understand huge forces. So rules of the universe. Do you have a future in physics? Well, to find out, let's take this test. Do you ever wonder how basically everything moves? Do you like working with math and numbers? Is riding a roller coaster a science experiment for you? Or how about gravity? Are you drawn to it? Did you answer yes to any of those questions? Well, congratulations. You have what it takes to be a budding physicist. A physicist is a scientist who studies forces and motion. There's so much to study too. Earth and everything in the universe is moving and forces make that motion happen. They're the two rulers of the universe. Studying everything in the universe isn't easy. There's always more and more data about the way things move and the forces at work. And new data means more questions. It can make your head spin. Physicists use graphs, charts, and other infographics to help sort through the information. These graphics can make those big mysterious ideas a bit clearer. Are you ready to join the fun? Well, let's get moving. Constant motion. You are always on the move, even if you are standing still. Earth is doing all the moving. It's in constant motion. It's hard to believe it, isn't it? Let's take a closer look at motion. What is motion? Motion is when something moves. Here are two kinds of motion. Translation and rotation. Translation is when an object moves on a line or a curve. Okay, so here's translation. It's going around. Earth orbits the sun. It moves along a curved line around the sun. Now we don't see this line, but we know that it goes in the same path. Rotation is another type of motion. It's when an object spins around its center of gravity. Earth does that too. It spins around its center axis. So Earth is spinning this way, and while it's spinning, it's moving around the sun. So it's doing two types of motion at the same time. It takes energy to make motion happen. Potential energy is stored energy when it is used to make motion it becomes kinetic energy. That is the energy that's being used. So let's take a look at motion of a soccer ball. As you get ready to kick, you have potential energy. You launch it into the air, setting it into motion, and it uses kinetic energy to fly in the field of translation. And as it does it, the ball spins as it flies through the air, and that's rotation. 
Here's a wheel of forces. Now, you can't always see them, but you can see what they do. Sounds mysterious, don't they? They're forces, different types of pushes or pulls. Different forces affect motion in different ways. Sometimes the force is you, and sometimes the force is acting upon you. And many times, more than one force is applied at the same time. Spin the wheel to check out some of the different forces at work in the universe. So, if we force spin, all right, if we look at the different types of forces, there's electrical, magnetic, gravity, tension, spring, normal, and friction. Did you happen to notice that forces require two objects to interact? Well, they do. So for electrical, this force is the push or pull of electric charges, okay? So if we have like electricity helps the car move, okay, or the light turn on. Magnetic force is when magnets at opposite ends push things away. It causes a force. Gravity, we don't see, but all objects are affected by gravity and it helps us keep um, on the ground. Friction is when, is a, is a push, when it happens with two things as they are rubbing together, they create energy and force and if you do that with your hands can you hear mine rub your hands together and you'll feel heat that's friction when two things rub together normal is a foot a push or a pull and spring think about like if you're bouncing like on a trampoline like you put force down and it springs you up and that's the same with tension too. When you put tension on something, think of like a, um, a slingshot, you know, where you put like a, we always use little tiny rocks or dog food and you pull back and then you let it boom, go flying through the air. So there's also what they called balance and unbalanced forces. Forces are balanced or unbalanced. When they're unbalanced, or I'm sorry, when they're balanced, they're equal. When they're unbalanced, they're not equal. A sled can show both balance and unbalanced forces. At the top of the hill, gravity pulls on the sled and the ground pushes up in equal forces. When the sled moves, friction pulls the sled downhill. And as it's going down, this is an unbalanced force. Did you know that there are different types of gravity? We all feel the effects of gravity, but gravity wasn't understood until Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein came along. Newton first thought about how gravity acted and Einstein built upon that knowledge, figuring out what caused gravity. Take a look at how these two brilliant scientists change the way we think about gravity. So here's Newton, okay? He's showing that gravity is the force that kept the moon in the Earth's orbit. Here's the Earth, there's the moon, and the moon orbits, so it, it goes through translation around the Earth. But ironically, the moon does not rotate as it moves around the earth. We only ever see one side of the moon. Then over here is Einstein who showed us how a planet bends in space-time, keeping an object in its orbit. So Isaac Newton. So he was born in 1642 
and he died in 1727. He was an English physicist and mathematician. He realized that gravity holding objects to the Earth's surface extended far above the Earth. He believed that the same gravity held the moon in the Earth's orbit. He called this the law of universal gravitation. This theory looked at how gravity worked through space or distance. Newton's idea described the strength of gravity very well. He knew it existed and was strong enough to hold planets in orbit around the sun. His theory had a huge problem though. He couldn't explain how gravity worked. So along came Albert Einstein more than 200 years later. Albert Einstein was born in 1879 and he died in 1955. He started thinking about light. He found that the speed of light was so fast that nothing else could go faster than it, not even gravity. He started thinking about how gravity worked with space and time combined, space time. Einstein discovered that a large mass curves space time. It explained how gravity worked. For example, planets move around the sun in a circle. This is because the planets follow the curve in space-time that is made by the sun. This was Einstein's general theory of relativity. Amazing. Here is Ole Anatomy. So, skateboarding tricks are all about physics. How many of you like to skateboard? Forces rule how fast a skater can go. They also rule how much air a skater can get. The Ole is a basic skateboarding trick. It is one that every good skater must master before trying harder tricks. Check out the physics involved with the Ole. So here's before the trick starts, okay? Forces are already in action. Then we have the skater pushing off the board forward. And as it moves faster and faster, now it's time for the trick. The skater straightens his legs and raises his arms, and this makes the skater's rear foot push down on the tail of the board. The rear foot has more force pushing down than the front foot. The nose of the board lifts up. The, ta the tail hits the ground. The ground pushes with an upward force on the tail and this makes this board bounce up. In the air, the skater drags his front foot forward. It stretches against the rough surface and this causes friction. Then the skater pushes down on the front force on the nose and he pulls his rear foot up at the same time. The real rear wheels go up and the board straightens out. The board and the skater use gravity to fall back down to the ground. Then the board hits the ground and the force of the ground pushes back on the board and the skater bends his legs. It helps the force spread out in his body. His legs might be hurt if he does not do this. So, how does all this work? With motion. The laws of motion. Remember, Isaac Newton, he thought about motion too, not just gravity. He developed three laws of motion. The laws are about how objects interact. The objects can be great or small, from massive planets to tiny atoms. They apply to people too, including you. These are his laws of motion. 
An object at rest or in motion stays that way until acted upon a force by force. An object will not accelerate until a force acts upon it. An object stays at rest or moving at the same speed in the same direction until acted upon a force. Force equals mass of acceleration. The more force put on an object, the greater the acceleration. Also, the same force put on objects of different mass cause different amounts of acceleration. And for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So what does this even mean? Well, if I had a marble and it was sitting here, it is not gonna move until I push it, okay? And depending on how hard I push it, depends on how far it goes. Faster, faster, faster. It's fun to go really fast. Ever try it on your bike? Speed is how fast something is moving. To find speed, you need to know how long it took something to get from one point to another and you need to know the distance that was traveled. There's an equation for determining speed. It is speed equals distance divided by time. Check out these amazing fast speedsters. Whoo, the fastest human was able to run 28 miles an hour. Whereas the fastest land animal, the cheetah, can go 64 miles an hour. The fastest car can go 267 miles per hour. Wow, that's really fast. The fastest train can go over 302 miles per hour. And this train actually uses magnets. The fastest sound, well, I'm sorry, fastest, is sound. Sound actually travels 741 miles per hour. That's really fast. Earth's orbit, well, it goes around the orbit at 67,062 miles per hour. It's incredible that we don't feel it moving. Light travels faster than anything. 670,000, I'm sorry, million, 615,200 miles per hour. Whew, that's really fast. Roller coaster thrills. Twists, turns, upside down, rolls, and terrifying plunges. They're all Here's part of the thrilling roller coaster ride. But how come riders don't fall out of the cars? And why do the cars stay on the tracks? It's because forces, energy, and inertia are at work. So we start off by roller coasters. First of all, they don't have any engines. A cable or lift pulls the cars. That's when you hear lift. Tick, 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 okay. Up the hill. The cars gather lots of potential energy on the way up. The higher the hill, the more energy that is stored. And if the cars have more energy, they will move really fast on the track. That's why when you see roller coasters and you see the cars, they have people spread out throughout the whole entire car because the more weight you have, the faster you'll go. So now it's coming to the top. Now it's time for kinetic energy to take over and gravity pulls the cars. They speed down the hill and friction from the car's wheels helps keep the cars on the track. The cars gather enough energy to make the top of the next hill and Newton's first law kicks in too. Inertia keeps the cars moving up the hill. And whee! the cars speed up to the loop and gravity pulls to the center 
of the loop when the cars are upside down. The normal force of the track also pushes on the car, and together these two forces cause the cars to go in a circular path instead of a straight line. That'd be freaky. The cars lose energy towards the end of the track, and wind and friction on the track slows down the ride. The cars can only get up smaller hills now. When the brakes at the end of the rides stop the car, then it's time to get out. So powerful magnets. So what kind of magnetic energy is there? Well, you can find magnets in just about every machine. They're hidden inside most of the things we use every day, but not all magnets are the same. Some are extremely powerful and some are very weak. Take a look at some of the strengths of the different magnets. And this is that train I was telling you about, the Magli trains. This train doesn't even have an engine. Instead, strong magnets and electric current power them. The trains glide on air. It makes for a smooth and incredibly fast ride. Most can reach speeds from 150 to 250 miles per hour. They're quieter than regular trains and better for the environment too. Here's how the magnetic and electric current make these trains work. So we've got the train and the rail, okay? So here's the rail and the rail goes, and this is the magnet, okay? Here's the train magnet and here's the current magnet on the track, okay? And here's the guide magnet. So it's literally the floating and it just flies. But the two magnets, what they do is they, um, they're opposite or they're, um, not opposite, opposites attract, they're, they're the same, so they kind of push away. And then with electricity current going through it, an electric magnet is what it is, it creates energy and it pushes the train out, um, out the track. Surviving a NASCAR race, wreck, crash, goodness. If you drive fast, you can crash hard. And NASCAR cars reach some of the highest speeds possible. Car crashes are part of the sport. Crashes are also an example of Newton's law of motion in action. Here's how specially designed NASCARs and other safety devices keep drivers safe during crashes. So when we look here, kinetic energy and the speed have a lot to do with each other. The car, or the faster the car goes, the more kinetic energy it has. A crash stops the forward motion of the car, but there is still a lot of kinetic energy in the car. It has to be released, and it becomes, um, it becomes heat and sound and transformed into different parts, or transferred to different parts of the car. So when something crashes, the energy has to go somewhere. And a NASCAR is designed to control where that energy goes, unlike a regular car that we all drive in. It has, um, it has crumple zones, okay, at the front and the rear of the car. So it kind of takes more of the force at the front and the back of the car so that the things in the middle, the driver, I mean, yes, they're going to get hurt, but it could be a lot worse. So during a crash, the front and rear crumples first around the driver because the car frame is a lot stronger. Isaac Newton found that an object in motion stays in motion unless a force acts upon it. And when speed is added, the object has momentum. So while the car crashes around the driver from the force of the crash, the driver still has a forward motion. That's why seat belts are so important. Without seat belts, the driver would just fly forward 
and be severely injured. A NASCAR seatbelt has six straps that, that meet near the driver's pelvis, and a special device also supports the driver's head. These systems provide the force that stops the driver's momentum. The car is usually totaled, but the driver walks away with little to no harm. That's the car design and the driver's safety devices working perfectly. Both used physics to protect the driver. There are many different jobs for simple machines, and we're going to actually be learning about simple machines in another unit. But first, we have to understand force and work and um, motion. So there's 10 jobs for simple machines. Do you ever think, oh man, that's too hard. I wish I could make it easier. Well, a simple machine may be just the thing that you need. Simple machines are the basic tools that make work easier. They are in lots of um, tools that you use every day. Check out some of the cool jobs that are made easier with simple machines. And the types of simple machines, there's six simple machines that are used in millions of ways. There's the inclined plane, okay, it's like hail, the wedge, screw, lever, pulley, and wheel and axle. So when you get to this page um, in your book, you can look at the different examples of simple machines and read about each one of these. Twinkle, twinkle, little satellite. If you just turn on the TV or make a call on a cell phone, you are instantly accessing information sent by a satellite. The sky is full of these complex machines. Satellites use two or more simple machines. That's what makes them complex. More than 1,000 satellites orbit Earth. The United States has the most satellites, more than 400 of them. Here's a close-up view of these complex machines. And this is an example of a, what a satellite looks like and what different types of satellites are found in the sky. So it looks like the military, the military and the government have an equal amount, or I'm sorry, the military and civil have an equal amount. This is how many the um, government and this is commercial like our cell phone towers. Machines on Earth receive the information from the satellite. So bloop, 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 they send it down. The satellite orbits the Earth in space and it, it receives information from machines on Earth. Rocket power. Breaking away from Earth's gravity isn't easy and rocket science know all about that. This is one of their biggest challenges when designing rockets meant to go to space. Guess where they begin? with Isaac Newton and his equation about gravity, force, and mass, and acceleration. And here's how rocket designs help use Isaac's ideas. So you see here is explanations of rocket power. Mrs. Plute is going to stop here, and you are going to be logging on to Epic, and you're going to be reading the rest of the story about forces and motion through infographics, and then taking a quiz at the end.